I just want to start by welcoming everyone and thank you, you for joining the Copyright Alliance's webinar on artificial intelligence and copyright, the next frontier. Um, I'm Kevin Madigan. I'm VP of Legal Policy and Copyright Council, and I'm joined by my colleague, Rachel Kim, who is Copyright Policy, Policy Council. Um, so before we jump into the presentation, I wanted to give a little background on the Copyright Alliance for anyone who may not be familiar with our organization and mission. Uh, the Copyright Alliance is the unified voice of the copyright community, uh, representing the interests of thousands of individuals and organizations all over the United States and across the spectrum of copyright, copyright disciplines. Uh, we're dedicated to advocating for policies that promote and preserve the value of copyright and to protecting the rights of creators and innovators. Um, and we do that in a number of ways from working with lawmakers and government agencies like the Copyright Office and by educating people on the value of copyright and uh, important issues that affect copyright owners like generative artificial intelligence. Um, and if you want to learn more about what we do, please do check out our website if you haven't already. Um, we have a ton of materials available there, and I'll also encourage everyone to uh, join the Copyright Alliance because membership is free for individual creators. Okay, um, so let's take a qu quick look at what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to start off talking about some of the most important AI issues for creators and copyright owners to understand which are generative AI input, meaning, meaning the ingestion of copyrighted works to develop AI systems. Then we'll talk about generative AI output and whether the material that is generated by AI is copyrightable. We'll also talk about infringement, transparency on the part of AI developers to show what exactly they're using for AI ingestion, and also issues related to the removal or alteration of copyright management information from works, uh, which is also known as CMI for short. And just a note that if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A function and we will try to answer some of those at the end. Okay, so before I turn things over to Rachel to talk more about those issues, I wanna talk briefly about generative AI technologies and platforms. Um, and we use the term generative AI to describe these new tools that utilize AI to produce some kind of output, you know, rather than more maybe traditional forms of artificial intelligence that have other uses that don't necessarily involve the generation of new material or content. So the first group is text generators, sometimes referred to as large language models or, or LLMs. And these types of AI models ingest massive amounts of text or literary works, sometimes scraped from the internet and gathered into these huge data sets. And then users can use these LLM tools to, they can ask at them or prompt them to you know, answer a question or generate new text. And popular examples of text generators are ChatGPT, which I'm sure everyone's heard of, um, and also Google's Bard. Um, the next group is image generators, uh, which ingest large amounts of visual artworks, you know, photographs, or really any other images. And again, you know, sometimes scraped uh, sort of indiscriminately from the internet. And these type of generators allow users to enter text prompts or to upload, sometimes upload their own images to produce then a new image. Um, and these tools include uh, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, Dolly, Adobe's Firefly, and DeviantArt's DreamUp platform. Uh, then there are video and motion picture generators. Now these tools for the most part are not as developed as the text or image generators um, at this point, but they are advancing and there are some tools that allow users to produce short videos based on text prompts or a combination of text prompts with a user uploaded video. And these tools include Meta's Make a Video, Google's Imogen Video, Wonder Dynamics, and also Mid Journey. Um, the last group I want to mention is music generators. Um, these are tools that um, can ingest pre existing sound recordings and allow users to use text prompts to generate new music. Um, these tools inc include OpenAI's Jukebox and MuseNet, um, and also Google's Music LM. Uh, so, with that background, sort of on the existing platforms and tech technologies out there, I will hand things over to Rachel now to talk a little bit about ingestion outputs and other issues. Thanks, Kevin. So, as Kevin mentioned in the agenda, we're going to break down some of these AI copyright law issues sort of into two buckets, so to speak. So 
um, or the equation, the AI equation. So you have the AI input side of the equation and you have AI output side of the equation. So on the AI input side of the equation, you're, you know, we're asking, okay, what are the copyright law implications here? What are, you know, the issues? Um, so, you know, as a general matter, AI machines really do rely on using copyrighted works, ingesting them for training AI machines to produce the output that they produce, right? Um, so, you know, they do this primarily through um, a technique called text and data mining, where, you know, the AI uh, machines basically call a lot of what is called data, but, you know, it in also includes copyrightable, you know, expressive value found in these works. Um, to train AI machines uh, so that they can develop their algorithms and, and methods to uh, generate the kind of outputs that you see today from a lot of these generative AI platforms. Um, so really we're talking about, you know, what is the value of copyrighted works? Like why are they using these copyrighted works? And, and um, it's because the quality that you put into the training that you put into these AI machines is also going to be determinative of the quality of the output, right? So it's quality in and quality out. So again, this is one of the benefits of copyrighted works, right? Um, these works um, have high creative value, high expressive value that's protected under copyright law. Um, so that's definitely one of the benefits. Other benefits include things like some, some of these works have metadata and other kinds of um, information that makes it easier for AI companies to you know, use in AI training processes. Um, another kind of issue on the input side, as Kevin kind of alluded to earlier, was is you know, how are these works being sourced by AI companies? Um, you know, how are they gathering all of these copyrighted works together in order to train AI machines? And as, you know, um, Kevin mentioned when he was talking about the different generative AI uh, platforms that are out there, um, you know, a lot of these uh, machines used a lot, a lot of copyrighted works. So where do they get all these works, right? So um, there is a lot of scraping done on the internet, indiscriminate scraping, you know, of legitimate websites, but also illegitimate websites. There's, um, you know, articles and press out there kind of investigating, you know, what are the sources um, for some of these copyrighted works, you know, in, in the training of these AI machines. And they found out that there's, you know, pirate or illegal websites that contain, um, you know, uh, unauthorized uh, pirated copies of, of copyrighted works that have been incorporated into training data sets and thus into AI machines. Um, so those have been just all scraped up from the internet. There are, you know, responsible AI developers out there as well um, who do secure the AI licenses that are offered by copyright owners. So we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, AI licenses as well, but basically copyright owners have been offering uh, licenses, right? Some of them have been offering licenses uh, for their copyrighted works to be used for AI training purposes, for text and data mining purposes, um, even before the rise of generative AI, uh, you know, late last year. So this AI licensing market has existed, it's in place. Um, another point, you know, uh, 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 another sourcing point for AI companies can also be, you know, public domain works. So really the main legal issue sort of on the AI input side again is, you know, are copyright owners rights being infringed here, but, and, and specifically, you know, are the reproduction rights being infringed? And, you know, largely the answer is going to be yes, for the most part, when um, these ingestion issues come up, there is going to be, you know, copying happening at some point um, in the training process. And thus, you know, the copyright owner's reproduction right is being implicated absent a valid defense. So what is one of the biggest defense, most common defense arguments that are made um, by AI companies? So it's largely going to be about fair use. Um, and again, this is a common argument, but I think as a general matter, it's important for um, you know, us to take a step back and kind of understand the fair use doctrine 
is a very case-by-case -case basis, as Kevin mentioned earlier, by pointing out the different kinds of generative AI platforms. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of AI machines in very different kinds of creative fields and the way they use copyrighted works um, and the purpose they use it for and everything may not always be the same. And so there's no way to kind of definitively say across the board, right, um, that, that fair use does or doesn't apply. It is a case by case basis, but you know, there are some considerations we can think about when thinking about the fair use test, right? Um, another thing to think about when we think about fair use arguments is that it's a holistic four factor test that requires a balance of all four factors that you see on the slide um, here. So, you know, we, we hear a common argument being made that yes, you know, ingesting copyrighted works for AI training qualifies for the fair use exception, um, particularly because it is a transformative use. And the transformative use argument um, is a sub factor, as you see on the slide, of factor one out of the four factors of the fair use test. Um, but, you know, the Supreme Court came out with a decision in the Andy Warhol Foundation versus Goldsmith case earlier this year, um, where the Supreme Court really did take a stance in, in saying, hey, look, you know, the transformative use test. Um, it's important, but it is just a sub factor of one factor of four factors um, within the fair use analysis. So um, really, you know, before the arguments that were being made on fair use by AI companies was mainly, you know, this is transformative use and thus, you know, it is just fair use period, right? Um, but again, I think the Supreme Court's decision in Warhol really um, brings us back to, again, that um, basic principle that all four fair, fact, four fair use factors have to be considered. Um, and especially given the fact, you know, under factor four, that courts also look at the effect of the use on the potential market for or value of the work. Um, again, as mentioned earlier, there are existing, you know, licenses um, for AI use of copyrighted works, right? These markets have existed for a very long time. Um, and, you know, as we see in a lot of the press today, especially with the explosion of generative AI um, over the past year, you see more and more licensing dealing, deals happening um, between, you know, copyright owners um, and AI companies. So definitely, you know, to say that there is, there is some effect, right, or lots of effect or the, the potential or the market is going to be very impacted. Um, if we say that, you know, ingestion of copyrighted works for AI training is just fair use, right? There's going to be a very tremendous negative impact um, on copyright owners. All right, so that's sort of on the AI input side of, you know, the equation again. So now focusing and shifting our focus on the AI output side of things. So um, when we're talking about AI output, right, this is the these are the works, right? The images, the text, um, the, the videos that the AI is generating based on prompting, you know, from human creators. Um, so when we're talking about AI output issues, mostly the issues are right now about copyrightability. Um, you know, are these AI generated works or AI assisted works uh, protected by copyright law? Um, what, is, what extent is their protection? Um, so, you know, these are the issues that, um, you know, courts are dealing with, that the Copyright Office has engaged with, um, you know, since, uh, since the past year. So um, in terms of how creators are using AI uh, in many different ways, again, I, I think you have creators who are using AI, who don't use AI, but the ones who do use AI, you know, you see, AI being used for ideation purposes. So being used to brainstorm different ideas of, you know, characters or settings for your sci-fi novel, right? Um, it's also being used to generate components of a larger work, right? Um, to, to fill in certain empty spaces of an image or, um, you know, to, to brush up here and there, right? So um, you, it's being used in that way. And then another way AI is being used is to just generate whole works, um, just 
put in prompts, um, or, you know, I say just put in prompts, sometimes the prompting, um, you know, I've learned is, is very, very um, involved, and sometimes it's a very iter iterative process. But, um, you know, when the AI is prompted and it generates the work, you know, that's how creators are also using AI. So what's the main legal issue here? Again, it's the copyrightability of these works, right? So um, it is about AI generation versus human authorship. So we can think of AI output copyrightability issues sort of on a spectrum, right? So um, taking a step back, you know, under the Copyright Act um, and, you know, under copyright law, uh, non-human authorship is not recognized. So if a non-human authored a work, it's not going to be protected by copyright law. Um, and so on one end of the spectrum, right, we'll talk a little bit more about this, about the Copyright Office's registration guidance for AI-assisted works. But on one end of the spectrum, you have works that have no human authorship, i.e., you know, it's been entirely mechanically produced by the AI, which is not going to be protected by copyright law because it lacks human authorship. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to have, um, you know, work that's wholly created by a human, right? There's totally human authorship there. And then you have everything in the middle um, where, you know, there's a combination or a hybrid of AI generation and human creative authorship and contribution happening. And so the question there is, okay, how do we draw the line between, you know, what it, copyright law will protect and not protect in those instances? So we'll go over a couple of copyrightability disputes um, to kind of illustrate the points. So the first copyrightability dispute that, uh, you know, we'll note is Thaler versus Perlmutter. So um, in this case, Dr. Stephen Thaler, um, tried to register this image that you see on the screen here uh, called A Recent Entrance to Paradise, where he claimed that the image was entirely authored by um, his AI called the Creativity Machine. Um, so on the registration application, you know, he claimed that there was absolutely no human authorship at all in this image. And the Copyright Office said, mm, sorry, we can't uh, register this work then, because uh, since non-human authorship, non-human authored works are not protected by copyright, copyright law, uh, we cannot grant the registration because we can't grant registrations for works that don't have, are not protected by copyright. Um, so they denied the registration, Thaler sued the Copyright Office in uh, the District Court of DC, and um, the court sided with the Copyright Office, you know, backing up the Copyright Office's arguments that the, co the Copyright Act does not protect uh, non-human authored works. So again, you have sort of the one end of that spectrum in this case of this was entirely generated by AI, authored by AI, no human authorship uh, involved. And so the registration the court held uh, was rightly uh, rejected. All right, so now we're moving along the, that spectrum I talked about earlier a little bit more, right? So we have this uh, case of Chris Castanova's registration for their uh, graphic novel called Zaria of the Dawn. Um, so, you know, what had happened was Chris Castanova received a registration for the graphic novel, but then the office subsequently learned that uh, AI, AI tools had been used to generate certain parts of the work, specifically, you know, the images. Um, and so the office conducted a review and came out with a decision to limit the scope of the registration. Right, because they, they realized that in this graphic novel, there were AI generated images, but then there were also human authored text and then uh, human authorship or creative contributions in the form of selecting, coordinating and arranging different written and visual elements together into the graphic novel. So at the end of the day, they limited the scope of registration so that the registration covers Again, the human authorship parts. So that's the text selection, coordination, and arrangement of the elements, but it doesn't cover the AI generated elements like the images. 
um, they they said in in their opinion that um, you know the AI generated images were were generated in an unpredictable way. They were not controlled. The output was not controlled or guided by Cash de Nova, um, and so you know that's how they uh, decided you know the matter at the end of the day. Um, Chris Cash de Nova also applied uh, to to register a new work where um, they argue that the human authorship requirement is satisfied, you know, citing too many examples of, you know, creative prompting um, done to the AI to, to produce a specific output. Um, you know, as Kevin alluded to earlier, you can sometimes upload your own images. So Cash Nova argued, hey, you know, I uh, created and hand drew, like drew my own image and I, put it in as a prompt and et cetera, and so on and so forth. So that um, application is still pending with the office. But again, this is a good uh, case in kind of illustrating along the spectrum of like what, uh, where we draw that line of copyrightability. And then lastly, this is actually a very recent, um, you know, uh, matter that was decided by the Copyright Office just a week or two ago. Um, but in this case, you know, you have uh, the artist Jason M. Allen, who uh, tried to register the work that you see on the bottom of the screen there. Um, so this work actually won at a art competition, and it, you know, made the news because it was um, disclosed that AI had been used um, in the, the creation process of this work. So. Um, Again, Alan tried to register this work. The Copyright Office came back and said, hey, we know that AI was being used here. Can you describe your process a little bit further? Um, and, you know, Alan did. And at the end of the day, the Copyright Office said, okay, you need to um, disclaim parts of this work because it's generated by AI. It's, it's not authored by a human. And, you know, it's more than what we call de minimis, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but the Copyright Office basically requires applicants who want to register AI-assisted works to uh, disclaim or, or disclose, right, those uh, AI-generated elements um, that, you know, are are pretty, you know, original, right? Like they they are pretty creative and they comprise a, a good chunk of, of the work, right? Um, and so what the office said specifically though, so these are the, the three points you see on the slide. Um, so there were three different kind of uh, AI tools being used uh, in this creation process. So Alan said, hey, I used Midjourney to, uh, to, uh, generate the output that you see at the top of the screen. Um, and I put in over 600 prompts and I, you know, guided uh, the, the machine to generate this output. Um, the office rejected that uh, argument as, you know, qualifying as sufficient human authorship. They said that, the, you know, the sole contribution of putting in text prompts into Midjourney is not human authorship. That um, Midjourney at the end of the day um, determines the output um, and not the prompter. Um, and so they they rejected that argument and they said, hey, look, this mid-journey image, this image that mid-journey generated, it's more than de minimis. It comprises a lot of the final work. And so you need to disclaim it. Um, the second tool that the office addressed was the, the use of the Adobe products to you know, clean up the the image here and there, and the, the office basically said, oh, we don't really know if, if this amounts to human authorship. We just don't have that much information. So they, they didn't really decide on that case. And then lastly, uh, an AI tool called Gigapixel AI was used to scale the image, um, but it didn't really introduce any new original elements into the image. Um, so you know that didn't qualify as human authorship either. And again, in this case, Alan tried to um, claim 100% human authorship in this work and didn't want to disclaim anything. And that's why the office at the end of the day uh, rejected his application um, to register this work. So again, we have a lot of line drawing of, you know, what was generated by AI, what is human creative contribution protectable under copyright law um, being kind of illustrated in these cases.
And so with that, I'm going to actually turn things back to Kevin to talk about some of the uh, infringement legal disputes um, in the courts. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, so yeah, now we're gonna get into some of the current court cases in which creators and other copyright owners have sued AI developers for copyright infringement, um, among many other things. Um, and many of these cases are based on allegations that these creators' works are being used without their permission by AI developers to train their AI tools, which then generate material that may or may not be infringing. So we'll start with a couple cases brought by visual artists uh, and copyright owners in photographs. Those are Anderson, the Anderson and Getty Images cases. Then we'll move on to a few cases brought by authors, um, including the comedian Sarah Silverman. Um, I'll also mention a case brought by an author, a uh, group of authors against Alphabet, Google's parent company, and then a case brought by coders uh, against GitHub for use of their codes to train AI. All right, so before I get in the cases, I just wanted to give a quick background on a couple sort of copyright issues and concepts. The first thing is that it's very important to understand, um, I think Rachel touched on this earlier, that there are two types of copyright infringement that can occur when we're talking about generative AI. The first is input or ingestion stage infringement. And that means that sometime during the ingestion process, a copy or reproduction of the work is made. And when that copy is made without the authorization of the copyright owner, that constitutes infringement. Now, the second type of infringement can occur at the output stage, uh, meaning that after the AI system copies expressive elements from a work that it ingests, it then generates material that can be substantially similar to one of the works that it ingested. Now, AI developers claim that this is a very rare occurrence, but um, I would say that it can and does happen, um, and it can be actually mitigated by certain safeguards implemented by AI companies. Now, the second thing I want to mention is this concept of direct versus secondary uh, liability in copyright law. So direct infringement occurs when a specific or identifiable person or entity engages in an act which violates the rights of a copyright holder. Secondary liability occurs when a person or a party indirectly contributes to or sort of facilitates infringement. And the reason I mention these concepts is uh, because in the cases I'm about to talk about, there are claims against AI developers for both input stage and output stage infringement, as well as direct and indirect infringement. All right, let's start off with Anderson v. Stability AI. So earlier this year, a group of visual artists filed a class action lawsuit against Stability Mid Journey and Deviant Art, alleging copyright infringement related to the unauthorized use of their works to train the, the company's AI image generating platforms. Um, the lawsuit also claims that that copyright management information, known as CMI, was removed from the plaintiff's works at some point during the ingestion process. Now, back in April, the defendant uh, AI developers asked the court to dismiss the lawsuit, arguing that the plaintiffs failed to show any acts of direct infringement and also failed to show that any of the AI tools output is substantially similar to any of the plaintiff's works. Now the court held a hearing in July during which uh, the judge was sort of skeptical that each of the defendants AI tools incorporated plaintiff's works. And he said that the plaintiffs needed to clarify the differences in their infringement claims against the various three defendants. Um, but the judge indicated while the judge indicated he would dismiss most of the claims due to these concerns, he did say that the plaintiffs could amend their complaint to include more specific, specific allegations. Um, and so we expect them to file a, an amended complaint that includes sort of more specific claims. Uh, the next case is one brought by Getty Images, who is the media and stock photography company against Stability AI, uh, both in the United States and the UK. Um, and the complaint alleges that Stability AI copied more than 12 million photographs from Getty's collection as a part of its effort to build a competing business. Um, in addition to claims for intentional copyright infringement, Getty alleges that Stability removed or altered its copyright management information, its CMI. Um, so back on May 2nd, Stability asked the court to dismiss the case, basically arguing that the court lacks jurisdiction over Stability UK and that the uh, complaint fails to state a claim. Um, and so in the alternative stability basically asked the uh, uh, cases to be combined and transferred into one case in the Northern District of California. So um, sort of the next step there is Getty has requested an oral argument to 
discuss uh, these jurisdictional issues. Now, the interesting thing about this case is that in its complaint, Getty provides evidence, sort of side-by-side -side evidence of AI-generated output that is arguably, arguably substantially similar to one of the copyrighted works that was used without it, their authorization. So here you can see on this slide, these two pictures of soccer players, um, you know, in, in my opinion, they look pretty substantially similar. So there's sort of one instance where uh, substantial similar output can be generated. Um, okay, moving on to the next case, which is Silverman v. OpenAI and also Silverman v. Meta. So in July, the comedian Sarah Silverman, along with a group of other authors, filed a class action lawsuit against OpenAI and also a separate suit against Meta, accusing the AI developers of copyright infringement related to the unauthorized use of their books to train their large lang language models, ChatGPT and Google's uh, or Meta's Llama. Um, the complaints allege that OpenAI and Meta harvested mass quantities of literary works through these illegal online, what they call shadow libraries, and made copies of plaintiff's works during the training process. And they also include claims about the, removable, the removal of copyright management information, which is something that basically every case I'm, I'm going to talk about includes. Um, so on August 28th, OpenAI asked the court to dismiss the secondary liability and, and copyright management information claims, but it did not address claim, the claims about direct infringement, which it says it will seek to resolve as a matter of law at a later stage in the case. Um, but it does make arguments that plaintiffs have not really shown infringement of their works based on substantial similarity. Um, the next case that I just want to quickly mention is JLV Alphabet. So in July, a group of anonymous plaintiffs filed a class action lawsuit against Google for the use of their personal information uh, and various copyrighted works to train Google's AI models. Um, the plaintiffs allege, allege piracy, sorry, privacy law violations, as well as direct and contrib contributory copyright infringement, and also the removal of copyright management information. Um, and in particular, the complaint alleges that Google's BARD tool reproduces verbatim excerpts from the copyrighted books when prompted. And then finally, I want to mention a case that's been going on for a couple of years now, and that's Doe v. GitHub. So back in November of 2022, a group of GitHub programmers filed a class action lawsuit against Microsoft and OpenAI for allegedly scraping their code from the internet to train Microsoft's AI tool uh, called GitHub Copilot. Now, earlier this year, Microsoft, uh, GitHub, and OpenAI asked the court to dismiss the case, arguing that the complaint fails to demonstrate a specific injury to the plaintiffs and therefore lacks a viable claim. Um, then back on May 11th, the district court issued an order granting in part and denying in part the defendant's motion to dismiss um, and basically allowing the plaintiffs to file an amended complaint, um, which the plaintiffs have since filed and that includes more specific examples of this alleged verbatim copying of plaintiff's code. So I, I know I just threw a lot of information at you about these cases, but you know I'll just note uh, to wrap up here that most of the cases are in their very early stages, and there have been no final rulings um, yet that would sort of indicate how courts are going to handle these AI issues. So, um, you know, it's something to keep an eye on uh, moving forward. Um, and with that, I will hand things back over to Rachel. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, you know, as Kevin was kind of going through the cases, I think it's, you know, apparent that the courts are very, very busy uh, with handfuls of AI um, infringement cases, um, but elsewhere in the government, um, there has been a lot of AI activities as well. So I mentioned earlier that the US Copyright Office has been very, very engaged on AI issues. Um, and one of the biggest and most important things that they've done, um, you know, earlier this year was to release their registration guidance um, that clarified their policies and procedures around how they examine and, you know, uh, registration applications for uh, works that have AI-generated elements that are AI-assisted works, et cetera. 
So, um, you know, in their guidance, they, they really point to the fact, again, that works mechanically generated by AI, like an AI that spits out an output, that output is not protected um, because, you know, they, they explained in their guidance that this output uh, is determined by the AI, it's not determined, you know, or thus authored by uh, the, the human, um, you know, creator who prompted the machine. Um, they do know, again, that because they recognize that there are works that have uh, AI elements, AI generated elements, and then human authored contributions, creative contributions that are protectable under copyright law. Um, and in those instances, they do say you can claim, you know, um, human, those human authored creative contributions protected under copyright law, but you must disclaim um, any uh, de minimis or more than de minimis, right, contributions uh, from AI, right? So what does this mean, right? Creative authorship, in the creative authorship context, something is deemed de minimis when a work doesn't contain that, uh, that minimal degree of original creative expression required um, to satisfy the originality test in, in copyright. So, um, you know, again, thinking back to that illustration in the Allen, um, you know, dispute, um, just knowing that that mid-journey image contributed very, very significantly is much more than de minimis, right? More than the, that minimal um, amount to that, in, as such that, you know, Allen at that point had to disclaim uh, that AI contribution on the registration application. Um, the office also noted that previously submitted or pending applications should be corrected or updated um, in accordance with this registration guidance. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I think a lot of creators were, were like, well, how do we draw that line? Like, how do we know, you know, what to claim and disclaim and disclose on, on our registration um, application? And so the, the office did have a webinar over the summer um, kind of explaining and walking through their registration guidance and providing um, examples um, and illustrations um, that's very helpful to, I think, watch. Um, but also, you know, the Supreme Court ruled in a case, uh, Unicolors, um, several years ago at this point, um, that mistakes made on a registration application won't, um, you know, invalidate the entire registration. Like mistakes are okay, so, you know, the, the tip is just do your best. Um, you know, obviously the courts are, <laughs> courts are looking into this, legal experts are looking into this and, and everything too. So, um, you know, just do your best under the registration guidance um, to, again, claim the human authored contributions and disclaim um, contributions or from AI. Um, that's, that's more than that de minimis. Um, and so, uh, other activities that the Copyright Office has been engaged in include these listening sessions, these public listening sessions they held over the summer in these four different types of creative fields where they invited uh, members of the public um, to comment on, you know, how AI is affecting them, how they're using AI, um, et cetera, just hearing what, uh, you know, the public, public stakeholders have to say both on you know from the creative communities and from creators but also from AI developers um, so they held these listening sessions um, and then you can also find all of the information on U.S. Copyright Office AI activities on their new AI web page as well and the link is on the slide. Um, again as mentioned they held a webinar over the summer on their registration guidance I highly recommend you know um, you go check that out um, and they also held a webinar on international AI copyright. Um, and then lastly, um, very, very recently at the end of August, uh, the Copyright Office uh, put out a notice um, asking the public for feedback and comments on uh, a, a whole host of questions that they have about um, AI and copyright law. Um, and these questions really get to a lot of you know, the issues that we talked about in the presentation today, sort of on the ingestion side and the training process, but also in the output side, um, you know, with infringement and um, also copyrightability of AI generated or AI assisted works. 
So um, highly encourage you know, creators to chime in and um, put your voice in and, you know, let um, your experiences be known and heard, you know, by the Copyright Office in terms of, you know, how AI is um, affecting you as a creator. So that comment period is currently open um, if anyone is interested in, in providing public comments. So elsewhere in the government, there has also been lots of AI activities. So, um, you know, you've probably heard something every single day, you know, some Congress member, some Senator, some representative is coming out with this, that, and the other. Um, so it's definitely a very hot topic on the Hill um, for many different reasons, but in terms of copyright law and AI, um, there are lots of activities there as well. So um, the first thing to note is, you know, is there any, of legislative movements around AI and copyright, um, how is Congress approaching these issues? So um, there is a Congressional Research Service report out there um, that kind of gives a lay of the land of, of, of some of the issues, some of the activities, some of the ongoings of um, you know, the AI and copyright world, but it suggests to Congress basically to take a wait and see approach regarding copyright and AI, noting that there are these active cases that are going through the courts, that the Copyright Office is examining these issues actively. Um, and so again, it just suggests Congress to take that way and wait and see approach. Um, in the meantime, you do have a lot of um, members of Congress, again, who are looking into AI and copyright law issues. Um, so specifically, Senator Chuck Schumer um, introduced a legislative, an AI legislative framework um, called the Safe Innovation for AI um, framework. And so as part of its accountability prong, um, you know, the senator, senator's framework calls for supporting creators by addressing copyright concerns um, and uh, protecting intellectual property. So um, copyright is, you know, part of the discussion there. Um, you also have multiple hearings that were held by uh, different parts of, of Congress, different committees and subcommittees, and copyright law conversations coming up in those contexts. So um, over so, so earlier this year and over the summer, um, you had the House Judiciary Committee's IP, Intellectual Property Subcommittee, um, hold you know, a hearing on AI and copyright that uh, featured, you know, some creators, some AI companies, et cetera, kind of giving their thoughts and views on, um, on, on how copyright law uh, applies to them, what rights are being implicated um, and different kinds of arguments, uh, you know, that can, that can come about in terms of, you know, how copyrighted works are being used and what, again, all the issues we talked about today, what it means for copyrightability on sort of the output side. They had the House Judiciary, uh, House Judiciary's IP subcommittee look into these issues. You had the Senate Judiciary Committee's IP subcommittee look into these issues as well. So there, you also had, um, you know, representatives, you know, from both the the AI company side and also from the creative communities come together to kind of give um, their perspectives and and their thoughts. Um, on, on the issues. And so the, the Congress, um, some members of Congress are really, really, you know, starting to key into these issues. Um, and you also have other committees, you know, within Congress that are looking at AI um, and, you know, sometimes copyright law comes up in those contexts, but um, mainly, you know, we have these IP subcommittees looking really hard and uh, closely at the copyright law issues in particular. So, Lots of activities happening on the Hill too. They're continuing to examine the issues. You have lots of activities in the courts. Um, you know, just yesterday and then like last week, there was a new, you know, new cases filed um, in terms of you know AI and copyright infringement um, cases. You know, filed by authors. There's just new activity happening every day. So um, we hope that sort of this overview helped you know, creators kind of understand uh, the issues that are at hand, what is being done by different parts of the government, what is happening in the courts, um, what's happening at the Copyright Office, 
Um, and we also encourage you to continue staying updated um, by, as Kevin mentioned earlier, signing up for a free creator membership. Um, you know, you go to copyrightalliance.org um, and then at the top, you'll see, you know, a sign up button. Membership is completely free, so please join. We also have an AI alert um, that you can sign up for in order to stay on top of the latest and greatest um, in, in uh, the AI and copyright world. Um, so with that, I'll throw things back over to Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And, I, you know, it's so true that there's just new developments every day now and, and, and events on the Hill every day. I think, in fact, today is the meeting of, at the White House of this giant AI summit with, um, you know, the uh, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, but also um, some of our member organizations. And I, I, I don't, copyright really isn't sort of like the main topic, but it might come up. So, um, you know, look for sort of reports on 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 that. Um, so we're finished a little early here, and I'm, I'm happy to um, go through some of the questions that uh, were asked in the Q&A. Um, there's a few of them, and I, I'm, I just, a couple jumped out at me. So I'm, I'm just going to go in here and say, well, okay, so one of them was, can AI make a case to have their original work protected, or is that impossible this time? I think, I think Rachel sort of covered this one. You know, if you're if you're claiming that AI was the sole creator of the work and, and want to say that it was the author, that is not something you can do at this time. Um, you know, the, the Thaler case, uh, which, which Rachel mentioned sort of, and, and the copyright office's re recent guidance says that this is not something that they will do. Um, they've been pretty clear that case law and um, even the constitution supports this idea of human authorship. Copyright is meant to uh, incentivize humans to create. Uh, machines don't understand incentivization and cannot be incentivized. So that's sort of one of their, their thinkings there. Um, one other question I saw that, that, that I like, because um, it's something I think about is, is AI generated content different than the content we create? We scrape our entire lives, experiences, music, books, articles, and develop our own ideas from that lifetime of ingestion. Um, we don't generally ask for copyright permission to create new content based on our own reasoning experiences. Um, really good question. Of course, we go through our entire lives experiencing things, um, you know, listening to music, watching movies, just going to a museum and looking at art, and we're, you know, processing those that that content into our brain um but i'll say two things about that because I, like i said i've thought about it before um one is when we are i don't really like to use the word scrape but when we are experiencing all of these uh different types of content throughout our lives yes we are in a way storing them in our memories and our brain um but we are not creating a data set that is potentially uh in the cloud somewhere online or made available to whoever wants to come along and use it. So there's sort of a security issue here when, when AI developers are just sort of gathering all this stuff and putting it in a, in a cloud and just offering it to the world that might be facilitating other uses outside of AI that are clear, you know, unauthorized uses like of, of piracy or what have you. So. That's one point I make. The second one I'll, I'll make is that for most times when we're experiencing music or movies or whatever, um, we are paying for it. Um, you know, you rent a movie, you go to the theater or what, you know, you have a subscription to iTunes for music or Spotify. You know, it, sometimes you don't think about it or even going to a museum. Um, if you're not, even if you're not paying directly, sometimes there are royalties making their way back to the copyright owner. Um, when things are scraped indiscriminately for online without permission, there is no compensation going back to anyone. So that's that's sort of my big difference with that question. Um, and just to add to that, you know, there there are instances, and again, Kevin talked about safeguards being built in some of these 
um, AI machines where it kind of prevents this kind of behavior um, by users. But um, you know, there there have been documented instances of prompting AI machines to verbatim, you know, come back with song lyrics or uh, you know, book text or whatever. So um, when you when you when you ask a human to do that, I'm sure there are very smart humans who can do that. <laughs> but large, large in part, um, you know, the fact that you can directly, you know, ask the AI machine to do that as well, um, I think says a lot about how AI is very different from humans or even images, for example, right? Like maybe text is not a great example because it's actually doable to, to memorize text as a human, but um, images, you know, to recreate certain um, subtle parts of images and, and to, to recreate it from complete memory. Um, again, probably some humans who can do that, but uh, machines are very, very different. Um, and that's why I think as Kevin pointed out, um, there, it, it's, it, it's just, there, these are two different entities, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so there needs to be different treatment. It can't be treated, you know, as if it was a human learning, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question on factor four um, of the fair use inquiry. It says, shouldn't the ultimate purpose of the use, i.e. to generate alternatives to the original scraped imager, images in direct com competition with them, count as harm, harming the market and the value of the original work? Um, I would say absolutely. I mean, I think Factor four and factor one, which are, you know, pretty much understood as the most important fair use factors, they're very interconnected. And so when the purpose of the use of the work, of the copyrighted work, is to train an AI system that is going to produce output that very well may act as a substitute for the works that were ingested in the marketplace, I think that's very much a factor for consideration um, that is going to weigh against fair use if it can be shown that, you know, you know, say you're a graphic designer and all your works are ingested without your uh, consent into an AI system. And then, you know, a client that you might have had is just going to go use that AI tool to get you know, something similar to what you would have had, you would have created. So there's a very, you know, real question about um, market substitution there under the fourth factor um, that, that I think is, is really important. Um, I see some, several comments or questions actually sort of getting to, um, you know, uh, respecting terms and conditions that are on certain websites and what that, what that means in the context of this indiscriminate scraping of copyrighted works, right? Like if I put something on my website that says, hey, like you can't scrape uh, my stuff, right? To train your AI, um, that should be respected, right? It is a term and condition. Um, sometimes it kind of gets into a little bit of contract stuff, but, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of these, robot, you know, the kind of crawlers can bypass that. And it can actually, you know, be evidence of even willful infringement, right? Of, um, and that affords the copyright owner heightened statutory damages if they ever bought, brought an infringement, a lawsuit, um, you know, in federal court um, to say, hey, you know, I put here explicitly, like, do not take my works and train them for your AI. Um, so, you know, while practically these measures um, might be bypassed here and there, you know, just noting that there are remedies in play um, that can really double down on having to respect those um, boundaries that you put um, on your websites. And, you know, another kind of common um, argument we hear is, well, you know, just different you know, technical measures, et cetera. Well, not technical measures, but, you know, technical things, right? To prevent your works from being 
scraped by uh, you know these web crawlers, et cetera. The the problem with that is it becomes sort of a Hobson's choice of um, you know sacrificing your entire website from even showing up on on uh, you know a Google search or a, or a um, you know a, a search of some sort because you've effectively super downgraded. Um, you know, like advertising and marketing your portfolios and stuff because you've instituted these other measures to prevent web crawling. So it's not really a choice, right? At the end of the day, it is, again, it's a Hobson's choice um, of, of having to, to choose. It's not an effective uh, a remedy or, you know, um, way to prevent you know, scraping. Scraping shouldn't even be happening in the first place is, is the position. But um, but yeah, in terms of sort of commenting on terms and conditions, uh, ways to, you know, prevent scraping. I mean, honestly, creators are not, you know, technologists, right? So um, it's it's also very unreasonable to ask creators to employ certain technologies to, you know, prevent, it, it should just be very simple. Like if you want to use my work, come ask me, period. Um, so I see one here that I'll answer because um, I think it really brings up a, a really good point. So it says, why does a case only hold water if a substantial, if substantial similarity can be shown uh, when similar works could be created later by someone using the AI software. Why is it not enough to say that an author's copyright is infringed upon, upon when it is used for training purposes against the wishes of authors? Um, this is like one of the points we've been trying to make um, for the last few months is that there are two separate parts of, or types of infringement here. A lot of AI developers want to say, because there's not substantial similarity in the output, there are no infringement issues whatsoever. That's not the way we see it at all. We don't think that is 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 in line with the law. We say no. Doesn't matter if the output is in, is infringing or not. When you make an unauthorized reproduction of someone's work to train a system, or when you ingest that work into the system, that is a standalone violation of your right of reproduction under uh, Section 106 of the Copyright Act. And it doesn't matter whether the output's substantially similar or not. And some may say, well, what's the harm? You know, if the output's not substantially similar, who cares if they use, you know, your work to train? And, and you know, one of, uh, I guess, the main answers to that is, well, copyright owners are, uh, have been, are, and will continue to create licenses for the training of AI systems. So there is a, uh, you know, factor for, effect uh on a on a potential market for your work you know if you wanted to commercialize your work for ai use training so um they're very they're two very separate inquiries and and that's what you know one thing we're really trying to get people to understand i see another question and this might be the last one um but the question is how do i know that you know i participate in in ai beta testing how do i know that ai is not harvesting my original works um in other words when using ai are we consenting to the ai tool uh reading our content that is in the same app to train their ai tool um so a lot of it so it's going to be dependent on sort of the terms and conditions for the different you know, AI tools, um, but mostly I think, I think a lot of them do have something there that says, you know, um, we can, we can use, you know, any, any data coming from like your use of our tools, you know, to help us develop our, our products. So this could theoretically include things like participating in beta testing, maybe putting your stuff into um, the AI as, as, you know, inputs or prompts. Um, but it, it really depends on uh, the AI tool or the AI machines, and, and it, it will be in their, their terms and conditions. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I think this will conclude our webinar for today. Um, but thank you so much to all of us, uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, and, uh, you know, we look forward to, um, you know, keeping you up to date on AI issues. Um, so again, just please visit us at copyrightalliance.org. And um, yeah, thank you again so much.